Chapter 14 of the Texan Star. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mr. Duck. The Texan Star by Joseph A. Outscheller. Chapter 14. Texas was then a vague and undetermined name in the minds of many. It might extend to the Rio Grande, or it might extend only to the Nueces, but to most the Rio Grande was the boundary between them and Mexico. So felt Ned and all his comrades. They were now on the soil which might own the overlordship of Mexico, but for which they, the Texans, were spending their blood. It was strange what an attachment they had for it, although not one of them was born there. Beyond, in the outer world, there was much arguing about the right or wrong of their case but they knew that they would have to fight for their lives and for the homes they had built in the wilderness on the faith of promises that had been broken. That to them was the final answer, and to people in such a position there could be no other. The sight of Texas, green and fertile, with much forest along the streams, was very pleasant to Ned, and those rough frontiersmen in buckskin who rode with him were the very men whom he had chosen. He had been in a great city, and he had talked with men in brilliant uniforms, but there everything seemed old, so far away in thought and manner from the Texans, and he could never believe the words of the men in brilliant uniforms. There the land itself looked ancient and worn, but here it was fresh and green, and men spoke the truth. They rode until nearly noon, when they stopped in a fine grove of oaks and pecans by the side of a clear creek. The grass was also rich and deep here, and they did not take the trouble to tether their horses. Ned was exceedingly glad to dismount, as he was stiff and sore from the long ride, and he was also as hungry as a wolf. "'Lay down on the grass, Ned, and stretch yourself,' said Carnes. "'When you're tired, the best way to rest is to be just as lazy as you can be. The ground will hold you up and let your lungs do their own breathing. Don't you go to workin' em yourself.' Ned thought it good advice and took it. It was certainly a great luxury to make no physical exertion, and just to let the ground hold him up, as Carnes had said. Obed imitated his example, stretching himself out to his great thin length on the soft earth. Two are company and twenty are more so, he said, especially if you're in a wild country. My burden of care isn't a quarter as heavy since we met Jim Bowie and all the rest of these sure friends and sure shots. This isn't much like San Juan's Eula, is it, Ned? You wouldn't like to be back there. The boy looked up at the vast blue dome of the heavens, then he listened a moment to the sigh of the free wind which came unchecked a thousand miles, and he replied with so much emphasis that his words snapped. Not for worlds, Obed. Obed White laughed and rolled over in the grass. I do believe you mean that, Ned, he said, and the sentiments that you speak so well are also my own. Smith and Carnes went a little distance up the creek and found some buffalo feeding. They shot a young cow, and in an incredibly short space, tender steaks were broiling over a fire. After dinner, all but two went to sleep. They understood well the old maxim that the more haste, the less speed, and that the sleep and rest through the hours of the afternoon would make them fit for the long riding that was yet before them. At five o'clock they were in the saddle again, and rode until midnight. The next morning the party separated. The men were to carry the blazing torch throughout the settlements telling all the Texans that the Mexicans were coming and that they were bringing war with them. But Bowie, Deaf Smith, and Carnes kept on with Ned and Obed. We're taking you to Sam Houston, said Bowie to Ned. He's to be the general of all the Texan forces, we think, and we want you to tell him what you've told us. They began now to see signs of settlements in the river bottoms where the forest grew. There were stray little log cabins, almost hidden among the oaks and pecans. Women and children came forth to see the riders go by. The women were tanned like the men, and often they, too, were clothed in buckskin. The children, bare of foot and head, seemed half wild, but all, despite the sun, had the features of the northern races. Ned could not keep from waving his hand to them. These were his people, and he was thankful that he should have so large a part in the attempt to save them. But he only had fleeting glances, because they rode very fast now. He was going to Sam Houston, famous throughout all the southwest, and Houston was at one of the new little settlements some distance away. He would tell his story again, but he knew that the Texans were already gathering. The messengers detached from the group had now carried the alarm to many a cabin. Several times at night they saw points of fire on the horizon, and they would pause to look at them. That's the Texans signaling to one another, said Deaf Smith. They're passing the word westward. They're calling in the buffalo hunters and those who went out to fight the Comanches and the Lipans. Ned had alternations of hope and despondency. 
He saw anew how few the Texans were. Their numbers could only be counted in thousands, while the Mexicans had millions. Moreover, the tiny settlements were scattered widely. Could such a thin force make a successful defense against the armies of Cos and Santa Ana? But after every moment of despair, the rebound came, and he saw that the spirit of the people was indomitable. At last, they rode into a straggling little village by the side of a wide and shallow river. All the houses were built of logs or rough boards, and Ned and his companions dismounted before the largest. They had already learned that Sam Houston was inside. Ned felt intense curiosity as they approached. He knew the history of Houston, his singular and picturesque career, and the great esteem in which he was held by the Texans. A man with a rifle on his shoulder stood by the door as a guard, but he recognized Smith and Carnes and held the door open for the four, who went inside without a word. Several men, talking earnestly, were sitting in cane-bottomed chairs, and Ned, although he had never seen him before, knew at once which was Houston. The famous leader sat in the center of the little group. He was over six feet high, very powerful of build, with thick, longish hair, and he was dressed carefully in a suit of fine, dark, blue cloth. He rose and saluted the four with great courtesy. Despite his long period of wild life among the Indians, his manners were distinguished. We welcome you, Smith and Carnes, our faithful scouts, he said, and we also welcome those with you who, I presume, are the two escaped from the city of Mexico. It was evident that the story of Ned and Obed had preceded them, but Carnes spoke for them. Yes, General, he said. They are the man, or rather the man and the boy. These are Obed White and Ned Fulton, General Houston. Houston's glance ran swiftly over them. Evidently, he liked both, as he smiled and gave each a hearty hand. And now for your story, he said. Obed nodded toward Ned. He's the one who saw it all, he said, and he's the one who brings the warning. Ned was a little abashed by the presence of Houston and the other important Texans, but he told the tale once more rapidly and succinctly. Every one listened closely. They were the chief members of the temporary Texan government, but the room in which they met was all of the frontier. Its floor was of rough boards. Its walls and ceilings were unplastered. There was not a single luxury, and not all of the necessities. When Ned finished, Houston turned to the others and said quietly, Gentlemen, we all know that this is war. I think there need be no discussion of the point. It seems necessary to send out more messengers gathering up every Texan who will fight. Do you agree with me? All said yes. I think, too, said Houston, that Santa Anna may now send Mr. Austin back to us. He does not know how well informed we are, and doubtless he will believe that such an act will keep us in a state of blindness. And you, my brave and resourceful young friend, what do you want to do? Fight under you. Houston laughed and put his hand affectionately on the boy's shoulder. I see that there is something of the courtier in you, too, he said. It is not a bad quality sometimes, and you shall have the chance that you ask later on. But meanwhile, you and Mr. White would better rest here a while. You may have some scouting and skirmishing to do first. We must feel our way. Ned and Obed now withdrew and received the hospitality of the little town, which was great, at least so far as food was concerned. They longed for action, but the rest was really necessary. Both body and spirit were preparing for greater deeds. Meanwhile, Houston, the scouts, and the Texan government went away, but Ned and Obed stayed, awaiting the call. They knew that the signals had now passed through all Texas, and they did not think that they would have to remain there long. They heard soon that Houston's prediction in regard to Austin had come true. Santa Anna had released him, and he had arrived in Texas, but he had not been cajoled. His eyes had been opened at last to the designs of the dictator, and immediately upon his return to Texas, he had warned his countrymen in a great speech. Meanwhile, the army of Coast was approaching San Antonio, preceded by the heralds of the coming Texan ruin. Ned and Obed sat under the shade of some live oaks when a horseman came to the little village. He was a strange man, great in size, dressed in buckskin, very brown of countenance, and with long hair, tied as the western Indians would wear it. He was something of a genial boaster, was this man, and he was known up and down the Texas border as the ring-tailed panther, although his right name was Martin Palmer. But he had lived among the Osage, Kiowa, and Pawnee Indians, and he was renowned throughout all the southwestern country for his bravery, skill, and eccentricity. An Indian had killed a white man and eaten his heart. He captured the Indian and compelled him to eat until he died. When his favorite bear dog died, he rode sixty miles and brought a minister to preach a sermon over his body. A little boy was captured on the outskirts of a settlement by some Comanche Indians. 
He followed them alone for 300 miles, stole the boy away from them in the night, and carried him back safely to his father and mother. Such was the ring-tailed panther, a name that he had originally given to himself, and which the people had adopted. One who boasted that he feared no man, the boast being true. He was heavily armed, and he rode a black and powerful horse, which he directed straight toward the place where Ned and Obed were sitting. "'You're Ned Fulton and Obed White, if report tells no lie,' he said in a deep, growling voice. "'We are,' said Ned, who did not know the identity of their formidable visitor. "'So I knew.' I just wanted to see if you'd deny it. Glad to meet you, gentlemen. As for me, I'm the ring-tailed panther. The ring-tailed panther? Exactly. Didn't you hear me say so? I'm the ring-tailed panther, and I can whip anything living, man or beast, lion or grizzly bear. That's why I'm the ring-tailed panther. Happy to know you, Mr. Ring-tailed panther, said Ned. And having no quarrel with you, we don't wish to fight you. The man laughed, his broad face radiating good humor. And I don't want to fight you either, he said, because all of us have got to fight somebody else. See here, your name's Obed and yours is Ned, and that's what I'm going to call you. No misterin for me. It doesn't look well for a ring-tailed panther to be given handles to people's names. Ned and Obed it is, said Ned with warmth. Then Ned and Obed, it's Mexicans. I've been fighting Indians for a long time. Besides being a ring-tailed panther, I'm three parts grizzly bear and one part tiger and I want you both to come with guns. Is it fighting? asked Ned, starting up. It's riding first, and then fighting. Our people down at Gonzales have a cannon. The Mexicans are coming to take it away from them, and I think there's going to be trouble over the bargain. The Texans got the gun as a defense against the Indians, and they need it. Some of us are going down there to take a hand in the matter of that gun, and you're going with us. Of course we are, said Ned and Obed together. In five minutes, they were riding, fully armed with the ring-tailed panther over the prairie. He gave them more details as they rode along. Some of our people have been gathering at San Felipe to stop the march of coast if they could, he said, and they've been drawn off now to help Gonzalez. They're coming from Bastrop, too, and other places, and if there ain't a fight, then I'm the ring-tailed panther for nothing. If we keep a good pace, we can join a lot of the boys by nightfall. We'll keep it, said Ned. The boy's heart was pounding. Somehow he felt that an event of great importance was at hand, and he was glad to have a share in it. But the three spoke little. The panther led the way, and Ned saw that despite his boasting words, he was a man of action. Certainly he was acting swiftly now, and it was quite evident that he knew what he was doing. At last he turned to Ned and said, You're only a boy. You know what you're going into, of course. A fight, I think. And you may get killed. I know it. One can't go into the fight without a risk. You're a brave boy. I've heard of what you did, and you don't talk much. I'm glad of that. I can do all the talking that's needed by the three of us. The Lord created me with a love of gab. The man spoke in a whimsical tone, and Led laughed. You can have all my share of the talking, Mr. Palmer, he said. The ring-tailed panther, corrected the man. I told you not to be Mr. and me. I like that name, the ring-tailed panther. It suits me because I fit and I fight till they get me down. Then I curl my tail and I take another round. Once in New Orleans, I met a fellow who said he was half horse, half alligator, and that he could either claw to death the best man living, stamp him to pieces, or eat him alive. I invited him to do any one of those things or all three of them to me. What happened? asked Ned. A broad smile passed over the man's brown face. After they picked up the pieces and put them back together, he said, I told him he might try again whenever he felt like it, but he said his challenge was directed to human beings, not to ring-tailed panthers. Him and me got to be great friends, and he's somewhere in Texas now. I may run across him before our business with the Mexicans is over, which I take is going to last a good while. It was now late in the afternoon, and dismounting at a clump of trees, the panther lighted the end of a dead stick and waved the torch around his head many times. Watch there in the west for another light like this, he said. Ned, who sat on his horse, was the first to see the faint circling light far down under the horizon. It was so distant that he could not have seen it had he not been looking for it, but when he pointed it out, the panther ceased to whirl his own torch. It's some friends, he said, and they're answering. They're saying that they've seen us and that they're waiting. When we get through, we'll say that we understand and we're coming. The whirling torch on the horizon stopped presently. The panther whirled his own for half a minute, then he sprang back upon his horse and the three rode rapidly forward. The sight of the lights sparkling in the twilight so far across the prairie thrilled Ned. He felt that he was in very truth riding to a fight, as the panther had said. 
perhaps it was part of the force of Kos that it was coming to Gonzalez. Kos himself had turned from the land route with part of his force and, coming by sea, had landed at Copano about two weeks before. Ned, having full cause, hated this brutal man, and he hoped that the Texans would come to grips with him. The night was at hand when they reached the four men sitting on horseback and waiting for them. They greeted the ring-tailed panther with few words but with warmth. They gave to Ned and Obed, too, the strong hand clasp which men in danger give to friends who come. Ned thrilled once more with pride that he should be associated with heroes in great deeds. Such they were, undoubtedly, to him. The Mexicans will be at Gonzales tomorrow, said one of the men. The place, as you know, has refused to give up its cannon and has defied them, but it's almost bare of men. I don't think they have a dozen there. The battle is generally to the strong if they get there in time, said Obed and here are seven of us on good horses. Not counting the fact that one of us is a ring-tailed panther with claws a foot long and two sets of teeth in his mouth, said Palmer. Ride on, boys, and ride hard. They urged their horses into a gallop and sped over the prairie. At midnight they clattered into the tiny village of Gonzales on the Guadalupe River, where everybody except little children was awake and watching. Lights flared from the cabins, and the alarm at first, lest they were Mexicans, changed to joy when they were disclosed as Texans. But the armed force of the place, though stout of heart, was pitifully small. They found only eleven men in Gonzales capable of bearing arms, and no more help could be expected before the Mexicans came the next day. But eleven and seven make eighteen, and now that they were joined, the communicating spirit and hope to one another, the eighteen were more than twice as strong as the eleven had been. The ring-tailed panther poured forth a stream of cheer and encouragement. He grew more voluble at the approach of danger, never had his teeth and claws been longer or sharper. I'm afraid of nothing except that they won't come, he said. If they don't, my health will give way. I'll be a droopin' and a pinin', and I'll have to go off and fight the Comanches and the Lipins to get back my strength. But he was assured that his health would not suffer. Mexican cavalry, a hundred strong, were coming under a captain, Casa de Nada, sent by Urgar Ticha, the Mexican commander at San Antonio de Bexar. Scouts had brought that definite news. They were riding from the west, and they would have to cross the Guadalupe before they could enter Gonzales. There were fords, but it would be a dangerous task to attempt their passage in the face of Texan rifles. The ferryboat was tied safely on the Gonzales side, and then the eighteen, every one a fine marksman, distributed themselves at the fords. Ned, Obed, and the ring-tailed panther stayed together. They did not anticipate the arrival of the Mexican forces before dawn. But Castaneda might send spies ahead, and the Mexican scouts were full of wiles and stratagems. At any rate, said the panther, if we catch any Mexican prowling around here, we'll throw him into the river. All things, including Mexicans, come to him who waits, said Obed. And speaking for myself, I'd rather they wouldn't come until day. It's more comfortable to sit quiet in the dark. These three and six others had taken a position under a great oak tree, where they were well shaded, but could easily see anyone who approached the ford on the opposite side. Back of them, a few lights burned in the little town, where the anxious women watched, but no noise came from it, or the second ford where the other half of the eighteen were on guard. Their horses were tethered some distance in the rear, and they, too, rested in quiet. The tree sent up a great gnarled root, and Ned sat on the ground, leaning against it. It just fitted into the curve of his back, and he was very comfortable, but he did not allow his comfort to lull him into lethargy. Always he watched the river and the farther shore. He had now become no mean scout and sentinel. The faculties developed fast amid the continuous fight for life against all kinds of dangers, above all, that additional sense which may be defined as prescience, and, which was a development of the other five, was alive within him, ready to warn him of a hostile presence. But Ned neither saw nor heard anything, nor did his sixth sense warn him that an enemy was near. The Guadalupe, wide, yellow, and comparatively shallow like most of the Texas rivers, flowed slowly and without sound. Now and then, Obed and the panther walked down toward the other ford, where all too was quiet, but Ned kept his place against the root. Toward morning, the panther sat down beside him there. Waitin's hard, he said. I like to jump on the enemy with claws and nails and have it out right there and then. I like to roar and bite. That's why I'm a ring-tailed panther. Ned laughed. If Castaneda is coming, and they say he surely is, he said, we'll soon have use for all our claws and teeth. Patience will bring our Mexicans, said Obed White. At daylight, women from the cabins brought them all coffee and warm food, for which they were very grateful. Then the sun rose, and the morning was fresh and crisp, it now being autumn. 
The men remained by the river, still watching intently, and Ned caught a sudden sharp glint, which was not of that of the sun, far out on the prairie. He knew that it was a brilliant ray reflected from the polished head of a lance, and he said as he pointed a finger, The Mexicans are coming. So they are, said the ring-tailed panther. I see a horseman, and another, and another, and now a lot of them. There must be a hundred at least. It's the troop of Castaneda, and they're after that cannon. Well, I'm glad. The man seemed to swell, and his eyes darkened. He was like some formidable beast about to spring. The boaster was ready to make good his boast. Run down to the other ford, Ned, said Palmer, and tell the men there that the Mexicans are at hand. Ned did his errand, but returned very quickly. He was anxious to see the advance of Castaneda's troop. The Mexicans, about half of whom were lancers and the rest armed with muskets, came on very steadily. An officer in a fine uniform, whom Ned took to be Castaneda himself, rode at their head. When they came within rifle shot, a white flag was hoisted on a lance. A white flag? This is no time for white flags, growled the ring-tailed panther. Never have any faith in a Mexican coming under a white flag. What we've got to do now is roar and rip and claw. Still, said Obed, it's evil to him who evil does, and we've got to wait till these Mexicans do it. First we've got to hear what they say, and if the saying isn't to our liking, as I'm thinking it won't be, then it's ripping and roaring and clawing and all the other ings to our taste as long as we can stand it. Go ahead, ground the ring-tailed panther. I'm not much on talking. Fighting's more in my line, and when it's that I come with a hop, a skip, and a jump, teeth and claws all ready. Ned, said Obed, you speak the best Spanish, so go down there to the bank of the river and hear what they have to say. Just remember that we're not giving up the cannon, and clothe the answers in what fine words you please. There isn't any rock here, but sooner this rock shall fry from its firm base than the Texans will yield their cannon when they are sure to be attacked by Indians and maybe Mexicans, too. Ned walked down to the edge of the river, and the officer, whom he rightly supposed to be Castaneda, dismounting, came to the shore at an opposite point. What do you want? cried Ned in pure Spanish across the water. Are you empowered to speak for the people of Gonzales? You hear me speaking and you see the other Texans listening. Then I have to say that on order of the General Coase, I demand your cannon in the name of General Santa Ana in Mexico. We've made up our minds to keep it. We're sure to need it later on. This is insolent. If you do not give it, we shall come and take it. Tell him, Ned, growled the ring-tailed panther, that we just hope he'll come and try and take it, that I'm here roaring all the time, that I've filed my teeth and nails till they're like the edge of a razor, and that I'm just hungering to rip and claw. The men of Gonzales mean to defend their cannon and themselves, called Ned across to the river. If you come to take the gun, it means war. It means more, too. It means that you will lose many of your soldiers. The Texans, as you know, are both able and willing to shoot. This is rebellion and treason, cried Castaneda. The great Santa Ana will come with a mighty force, and when he is through, not a Texan will trouble the surface of the earth. A roar of approval came from the men behind the Mexican captain, but Ned replied, until the earth is rid of us, we may make certain spots of it dangerous for you. So I warn you to draw back. Our bullets easily carry across the river. Captain Castaneda, white with rage, retired with his troop beyond the range of the Texan rifles. End of chapter 14. Reading by Mr. Duck. Chapter 15 of the Texan Star. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mr. Duck. The Texan Star by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter 15. Well, Ned, it's sometimes ask and ye shall not receive, isn't it? Said Obed White, looking at the retreating Mexicans. But the ring-tailed panther growled between his shut teeth. Then he opened his mouth and gave utterance to his dissatisfaction. It's a cheat, a low Mexican trick, he said, to come here and promise a fight and then go away. I'm willing to bet my claws that them Mexicans will hang around here for two or three days without trying to do a thing. And won't that be all the better for us? asked Ned. We're only 18 and we surely need time for more. That's so, admitted the ring-tailed panther. But when you've got your teeth and claws sharpened for a fight, you want it right then and not next week. The Mexicans tethered their horses and began to form camp about a half mile from the river. They went about it deliberately, spreading tents for their officers and lighting fires for cooking. 
The Texans could see them plainly, and the Mexicans showed the carelessness and love of pleasure natural to children of the sun. Some lay down on the grass, and three or four of them began to strum mandolins and guitars. There was a sterner manner on the Texan side of the Guadalupe. The watch at the fords was not relaxed, but Ned went back to the little town to carry the word to the women and children. Most of the women, like the men, were dressed in deerskin, and they, too, volunteered to fight if they were needed. Ned told them what Castaneda had asked, and he also told them the reply which was received with grim satisfaction. The women were even more bitter than the men against the Mexicans. Ned passed a long day by the Guadalupe, keeping his place most of the time at the ford with the ring-tailed panther, who was far less patient than he. "'My teeth and claws will surely get dull with me a settin' here and doin' nothing,' said Palmer. "'I can roar and I can keep on roarin', but what's the good o' roarin' when you can't do any bitin' and tearin'? "'Patience will have its perfect fight,' said Obed, giving one of his most quotations. "'I've always heard that every kind of panther would lie very quiet until the chance came for him to spring.' The ring-tailed panther growled between his shut teeth. The sight of the Mexican force in the afternoon became absolutely tantalizing. Although it was early autumn, the days were still very hot at times, and Castaneda's men were certainly taking their ease. Ned could see many of them enjoying the siesta, and through a pair of glasses he saw others lolling luxuriously and smoking cigarettes. It was especially irritating to the ring-tailed panther, who grew very red in the face, but who now only emitted growls between his shut teeth. It was evident that the Mexicans were going to make no demonstration just yet, and the night came, rather dark and cloudy. Now the anxiety of Gonzalez increased since the night can be cover for anything, and, besides guarding the fords, several of the defenders were placed at intermediate points. Ned took his station with Obed in a clump of oaks that grew to the very edge of the Guadalupe. There they sat for a long time and watched the surface of the river grow darker and darker. The Mexican camp had been shut from sight long since, and no sounds now came from it. Ned appreciated fully the need of a close watch. The Mexicans might swim the river on their horses in the darkness and gallop down on the town. So he never ceased to watch, and he also listened with ears which were rapidly acquiring the delicacy and sensitiveness peculiar to those of expert frontiersmen. Ned was not warlike in temper. He knew from his reading all the waste and terrible passions of war, but he was heart and soul with the Texans. He was one of them, and to him the coming struggle was a fight for home and liberty by an oppressed people. With the ardor of youth flaming in him, he was willing that the struggle begin at once. Night on the Guadalupe. He felt that the darkness was full of omens and presages for Texas and for him, too, a boy among its defenders. His pulses quivered, and a light moisture broke out on his face. His prescience, the gift of foresight, was at work. It was telling him that the time, in very truth, had come. Yet he could not see or hear a single thing that bore the remotest resemblance to an enemy. The boy stepped from a clump of trees in order that he might get a better look down on the river. There's a crack on the farther shore, a flash of fire, and a bullet sang past his ear. He caught a hasty glance of a Mexican with a smoking rifle leaping to cover, and he too sprang back into the shelter of the trees. It was the first shot of the great Texan's struggle for independence. Ned felt all its significance even then, and so did Obed. You saw him? asked the main man. I did, and I felt the breath of his bullet on my face but he gained cover too quickly for me to return his fire. The first shot was theirs, and it was at you. This seems odd, Ned, that you have been used as a target for the opening of the war. I'm proud of the honor. So would I be in your place. Others came, drawn by the shot. Was it a Mexican? asked the ring-tailed panther eagerly. Tell me it was a Mexican and make me happy. You can be happy, said Obed. It was a Mexican, and he was shooting with what the law would define as an intent to kill. He sent a rifle bullet across the Guadalupe, aimed at our young friend, Edward Fulton. Ned did not see the bullet, but his sensitiveness to touch showed that it passed within an inch of his face. Now the ring-tailed panther roared, but it was not between his shut teeth. By the great horn spoon, I'm glad, he said. All the waiting and backing and filling are over. We do our talking now with cannon and rifles. But not another shot was fired that night. It was merely some scout or skirmisher who had sent the fugitive bullet across the river, but it was enough. The Mexican intentions were now evident. Ned went off duty towards morning and slept a few hours in one of the cabins. When he awoke, he ate a hearty breakfast and went back to the river. About half of the eighteen had taken naps, but they were all gathered once more along the Guadalupe. Ned observed the Mexican camp and saw some movement there. Presently, all the soldiers rode out, with Castaneda at their head. 
They're coming to our ford. By the great horn spoon, they are coming, roared the ring-tailed panther. It seemed that he was right, as the Mexicans were approaching at a gallop, making a gallant show, their lances glittering in the sun. Lay down, all, said the ring-tailed panther. The moment they strike the water, turn loose with your rifles and roar and scratch and claw. But when they were within one hundred yards of the Guadalupe, the Mexicans suddenly sheared off. Evidently, they did not like the looks of the Texan rifles, which they could plainly see. The defenders of the fords uttered a derisive shout, and some of the Mexicans fired. But their bullets fell short, only a single one of them coming as far as the edge of the Guadalupe. The Texans did not reply. They would not waste ammunition in any such foolish fashion. The Mexicans stopped, when four or five hundred yards away, and began to wave their lances and utter taunting shouts. The Texans only laughed, all except the ring-tailed panther, who growled. You see, Ned, said Obed, that one charge does not make a passage. It appears to me that our friend Castaneda does not want his uniform or himself spoiled by our good Texas lead. Now, I take it, we can rest easy a while longer. He lay down in the grass under the trees, and Ned did likewise, but the ring-tailed panther would not be consoled. An opportunity had been lost, and he hurled strange and miscellaneous epithets at the distant Mexicans. Standing upon a little hillock, he called them more bad names than Ned had ever before heard. He aspersed the character of their ancestors even to the eighth generation, and of their possible descendants also to the eighth generation. He issued every kind of challenge to any kind of combat, and at last, red and panting, descended the hillock. Do you feel better? asked Obed. I've whispered a few of my thoughts. Yes, I can really say that the state of my health is improving. Then sit down and rest. It's never too late to try, try again. Remember that the day is long, and the Mexicans may certainly have a chance. The ring-tailed panther growled, but sat down. In the afternoon, the Mexicans again formed in line and trotted down towards the other ford. But as before, they did not like the look of the Texan rifles and turned away, after shouting many challenges, brandishing lances, and firing random shots. But the Texans contented themselves again with a grim silence, and the Mexicans rode back to their camp. The disgust of the ring-tailed panther was so deep that he could not utter a word, but Obed was glad. More men will come tonight, he said to Ned. You know that requests for help were sent in all directions by the people of Gonzales, and if I know our Texans, and I think I do, they'll ride hard to be here. Castaneda, in a way, is besieging us now. But, well, the tables may be turned and he'll turn with them. Just at twilight, a great shout arose from the women in the village. There was a snorting of horses, a jingling of spurs, and embroidered bridle reins, and twenty lean, brown men, very tall and broad of shoulder, rode up. They were the vanguard of the Texan help, and they rejoiced when they found that the Mexican force was still on the west side of the Guadalupe. Their welcome was not noisy, but deep. The eighteen were now thirty-eight, and tomorrow they would be a hundred or more. The twenty had ridden more than a hundred miles, but they were fresh and zealous for the combat. They went down to the river and, in the darkness, looked at the Mexican campfires, while the ring-tailed panther roared out his opinion. The Mexicans won't bring the fight to us, he said, so we must carry it to them. They've galloped down here twice, and they've looked at the river, and they've looked at us, and they've galloped back again. We can't let them set over there besieging us. We must cross and besiege them, and let them get to roaring and ripping and clawing. Tomorrow, said Obed, more of our friends will be here, and when we all get together, we will discuss it and make a decision. Of course we'll discuss it, roared the ring-tailed panther, and then we'll come to a decision, and there's only one decision that we can come to. We'll cross the river, and mighty quick we'll make a Mexican's wish they'd chose a camp a hundred miles from Gonzales. The others laughed, but, after all, the ring-tailed panther had stated their position truly. Every man agreed with him. The watch at the river that night was as vigilant as ever, and the next morning parties of Texans arrived from different points, swelling their numbers to more than one hundred and fifty men fully equaling the company of Castaneda, after allowing for reinforcements received by the Mexican captain. With one of the Texan troops came a quiet man of confident bearing, dressed like the others in buckskin, but with more authority in his manner. The ring-tailed panther greeted him with a great warmth, shaking his hand and saying, John! John! We're awful glad you've come, because there's to be a lot of roaring and tearing and clawing to be done. The man smiled and replied in his quiet tones, We know it. That's why we've come. Now I suggest that we leave ten men at each ford. We hold a meeting in the village. Everything we have is a stake, and one Texan is as good as another. We ought to talk it over. Who is he? asked Ned of Obed. That's John Moore. He's been a great Indian fighter and one of the defenders of the frontier. I think it likely that he'll be our leader in whatever we undertake. He's certainly the man for the place. Oh yes, oh yes, roared the ring-tailed panther with mouth wide open. 
Come all ye upon the common and hear the case of Texas against Mexico, which is now about to be debated. The gentlemen representing the other side are on the west shore of the river about a mile from here, and after deciding upon our argument and the manner of it, we'll communicate it to them later, when they like our decision or not. They poured upon the common in a tumultuous throng, the women and children forming a continuous fringe about them. I move that John Moore be made the chairman of this here meeting, and a leader in whatever it decides to do, especially as we know already what it's going to decide, roared the ring-tailed panther. And wherever he leads, we will follow. Ned said nothing, but his pulses were leaping. Perhaps the silent boy appreciated more than any other present that this was the beginning of a great epic in the American story. The young student, his held filled with completed dramas of the past, could look further into the future than the veteran men of action around him. The debate was short. In truth, it was no debate at all, because they were all of one mind. Since the Mexicans had already fired upon them and would not go away, they would cross the river and attack Castaneda. As Obed had predicted, Moore was unanimously chosen leader, the title of colonel being bestowed upon him, and they set to work at once for the attack. Ned and Obed walked together into the cluster of oaks into which the two had spent so much time. Both were grave, appreciating fully the fact that they were about to go into battle. Ned, said Obed, you and I have been through a lot of dangers together, and we're not afraid to talk about dangers to come. In case anything should happen to you, is there any word you want sent to anybody? To nobody except Mr. Austin. He's been very good to me here and in Mexico. I suppose I've got some relatives in Missouri, but they are so distant I've forgotten who they are, and probably they never knew anything about me. If it's the other way about, Obed, what word shall I send? Nothing to nobody. I had a stepfather in Maine who didn't like me, and my mother died five years after her second marriage. I'm a Texan, Ned, same as if I were born on this soil, and my best friends are around me. I'll live and die with them. The two, the man and the boy, shook hands, but made no further display of feeling. The force was organized in the village, beyond the sight of the Mexicans, who were lounging in the grass, although they had posted sentinels. Every Texan was well armed, carrying a rifle, pistol, and knife. Some had, in addition, the Indian tomahawk. It was the first day of October, and the coolness of late afternoon had come. A fresh breeze was blowing from the southwest. The little command, silent save for the hoofbeats of the horses, rode down to the river. The women and children looked after them, and they too were silent. A strange Indian stoicism possessed them all. Ned and Obed were side by side. The breeze cooled the forehead and cheeks of the boy, but his pulses beat hard and fast. He looked back at Gonzalez, and he knew that he would never forget that little village of little log cabins. Then he looked straight before him at the Yellow River and the shore beyond where the Mexican camp lay. It was now seven o'clock, and the twilight was coming. Isn't it too late to make an attack? he said to Obed. It depends on what happens. Circumstances alter battles. If we surprise them, there will be time for a fine fight. If they discover our advance, it may be better to wait until morning. They rode into the water twenty abreast and made for the farther shore. So many horses made much splashing, and Ned expected bullets, but none came. Dripping, they reached the farther shore and went straight toward the Mexican camp. But then came sudden shouts, the flash of rifles and the singing of bullets. The Mexican sentinels had discovered the Texan advance. Moore ordered his men to halt, and he held a short conference with the leaders. It was very late, and they would postpone the attack until morning. Hence, they tethered their horses in sight of the Mexican camp, set many sentinels, and deliberately began to cook their suppers. It was all very strange and unreal to Ned. Having started for a battle, it was battle he wanted at once, and the weight of a night rested heavily upon his nerves. Take it easy, Ned, said Obed, who observed him. Willful haste makes a woeful fight. Eat your supper, and then you'd better lie down and sleep if you can. I'd rather go on watch toward morning if I were you, because if anything happens in the night, it will happen late. Ned considered it good advice, and he lay down on his blankets, having been notified that he would be called at one o'clock in the morning to take his turn. Once more, he exerted will to the utmost in the effort to control nerves and body. He told himself that he was now surrounded by friends, who would watch while he slept, and that he could not be surprised. Slumber came sooner than he had hoped, but at the appointed hour he was awakened and took his place among the sentinels. Ned found the night cold and dark, but he shook off the chill by vigorous walking to and fro. He discovered, however, that he could not see any better by use, as the darkness was caused by mists rather than clouds. Vapors were rising from the prairie, and objects seen through them assumed thin and distorted shapes. He saw west of him, and immediately facing him, flickering lights, which he knew were those of the Mexican camp. The heavy air seemed to act as a conductor of sound, and he heard faintly voices and the tread of horses' hoofs. They were on watch there also. 
He walked back and forth a long time, and the air continued to thicken. A heavy fog was rising from the prairie, and it became so dense that he could no longer see the fires in the Mexican camp. Everything there was shut out from the eye, but he yet heard the faint noises. It seemed to him toward four o'clock in the morning that the noises were increasing, and curiosity took hold of him. But the sentinel on the left and the sentinel on the right were now hidden by the fog, and, since he could not confer with them at once, he resolved to see what this increase of noise meant. He cocked his rifle and stole forward over the prairie. He could not see more than ten or fifteen yards ahead, but he went very near to the Mexican camp, and then lay down on the grass. Now he saw the cause of the swelling sounds. The Mexican force, gathering up its arms and horses, was retreating. Ned stole back to the camp with his news. You have done well, Ned, lad, said Moore. I think it likely, however, that they are merely withdrawing to a stronger position, but they cannot escape us. We'll follow them, and since they wanted that cannon so badly, we'll give them a taste of it. The cannon, a six-pounder, had been brought over on the ferryboat in the night and was now in the Texan camp. Ned, said Moore, do you, Obed, and the panther ride after those fellows and see what they do, then come back and report. It was a dangerous duty, but the three responded gladly. They advanced cautiously through the fog, and the ring-tailed panther roared softly. Running away, he said. I'd be ashamed to come for a cannon and then to slink off with tail drooping like a cowardly coyote. By the great horn spoon, I hope they are merely seeking a better position and will give us a fight. It would be a mean Mexican trick to run clean away. The Mexicans are not cowards, said Ned. Depends on how the notion strikes them, said the panther. Sometimes they fight like all creation and sometimes they hit it for the high grass and the tall timber. There's never any telling what they'll do. Hark, said Obed. Don't you hear their tramp there to our left? The three stopped and listened, and they detected sounds which they knew were made by the retreating force. They could see nothing through the heavy white fog which covered everything like a blanket of snow. Suppose we ride parallel with them, whispered Ned. We can go by the sounds, and by the same means we can tell exactly what they do. A good idea, said Obed. We are going over prairie, which affords easy riding. We've got nothing to fear unless some lamb strays from the Mexican flock and blunders upon us. Even then, he's more likely to be shorn than to shear. They advanced for some time, guided by the hoofbeats from the Mexican column, but before the sun could rise and dispel the fog, the sound of the hoofbeats ceased. They've stopped, whispered the ring-tailed panther joyously. After all, they're not going to run away, and they will give us a fight. They are expecting reinforcements, of course, or they wouldn't make a stand. We must see what kind of position they have taken up, said Obed. Seeing is telling, and you know that when we get back to Colonel Moore, we've got to tell everything or he might as well have stayed behind. You're the real article, all wool and a yard wide, Obed White, said the ring-tailed panther. Now I think we'd better hitch our horses here to these bushes and creep as close as we can without getting our heads knocked off. They might hear the horses when they wouldn't hear us. Good idea, said Obed White. Nothing risk, nothing see. They tethered the horses to the low bushes, marking well the place, as the heavy white fog was exceedingly deceptive, distorting and exaggerating when it did not hide. Then the three went forward, side by side. Ned looked back when he had gone a half-dozen yards, and already the horses were looming pale and gigantic in the fog. Three or four steps more, and they were gone entirely. But they heard the sounds again in front of them, although they were now of a different character. They were confined in one place, which showed that the Mexicans had not resumed their march, and the tread of horses' hoofs was replaced by a metallic rattle. It occurred to Ned that the Mexicans might be entrenching, and he wondered what place of strength they had found. The boy had the keenest eyes of the three, and presently he saw a dark, lofty shape, showing faintly through the fog. It looked to him like an iceberg clothed in mist, and he called the attention of his comrades to it. They went a little nearer, and the ring-tailed panther laughed low between his shut teeth. We'll have our fight, he said, and these Mexicans won't go back to coast as fine as they were when they started. The tall and broad thing that you see is a big mound on the prairie, and they're going to make a stand on it. It ain't a bad place. A hundred Texans up there could beat off a thousand Mexicans. They went a little nearer and saw that the fringe of bushes surrounded the base of the mound. Further up, the Mexicans were digging in the soft earth with their lances as best they could and throwing up a breastwork. The horses had been tethered in the bushes. Evidently, they felt sure that they would be attacked by the Texans. They knew the nature of these riders on the plains. I think we've seen enough, said Obed. We'll go back now to Colonel Moore and the men. They found their horses undisturbed and were about to gallop back to the main body with the news that the Mexicans were on the mound, when some Mexican sentinels saw them and uttered a shout. The three exchanged shots with them, but knowing that the strong force would be upon them an instant, returned the original intention and went at full speed toward the camp. 
It was lucky that the fog still held, as the pursuing bullets went wide, but Ned heard more than one sing. The Mexicans showed courage and followed the three until they reached the Texan camp. As Ned and his comrades dismounted, they shouted that the Mexicans were on a hill not far away and were fortifying. More promptly had his men run forward that bone of contention, the cannon, and a solid shot was sent humming towards those who had pursued the three. The heavy report came back in sullen echoes from the prairie, and a stream of fire split the fog asunder. But in a moment, the mists and vapors closed in again, and the Mexicans were gone. Then the little army stood for a few moments, motionless, but breathing heavily. The cannon shot had made the hearts of everyone leap. They were inured to Indian battle and every kind of danger, but this was a great war. Boys, said Moore, we are here and the enemy is before us. A deep shout from the broad chests and powerful lungs came forth. Then, by a single impulse, the little army rushed forward, led by Ned, Obed, and the ring-tailed panther, who took them straight toward the mound. As they ran, the great Texan sun proved triumphant. It seemed to cleave the fog like a sword blade, and then the mists and vapors rolled away on either side, to right and to left of the Texans. The whole plain, dewy and fresh, sprang up in the light of the morning. They saw the steep mound crowned by the Mexicans, and the men still at work on the hasty trench. Again, that full-throated cheer came from the Texans, and they quickened their pace. But Captain Castaneda came down from the mound, and a soldier came with him bearing a white flag. Now what in thunder can he want? growled the ring-tailed panther to Ned and Obed. Surely he ain't going to surrender. He's just going to waste our time and talk. Deep disgust shows on his face. By waiting, we will see, quoth Obed oracularly. Now, panther, don't you be too impatient. Remember that the tortoise beat the hare in the great Greek horse race. Moore waved his hand and the Texans halted. Castaneda on foot came on. Moore also dismounted and, calling to Ned and Obed to accompany him, went forward to meet him. Ned and Obed, delighted, sprang from their horses and walked by his side. The ring-tailed panther growled between his teeth that he was glad to stay, that he would have no truck with the Mexicans. Castaneda, with a soldier beside him, came forward. He was rather a handsome young man of the dark type. As the two little parties met midway between the lines, the forces on the hill and on the plain alike were silent. Every trace of the fog was now gone, and the sun shone with full splendor upon brown faces, upon rifles and lances. Castaneda saluted in Mexican fashion. What do you want? he asked in Spanish, which all understood. Your surrender, replied Moore coolly. Either that or the sworn adherence of you and your men to Texas. Castaneda uttered an angry exclamation. This is presumption carried to the last degree, he said. My own honor and the honor of Mexico will not allow me to do either. It is that or fight. I bid you beware. General Cos is coming with a force that all Texas cannot resist, and after him comes our great Santa Ana, with another yet greater. If the Texans make more, they will be destroyed. The buffalo will feed where their houses now stand. You have already made war. Accept our terms or fight. We deal with you now. We deal with Cos and Santa Ana later on. There is nothing more to be said, replied Castaneda with haughtiness. We are here in a strong position, and you cannot take us. He withdrew and more turned back with Ned and Obed. I don't think he ever meant this parley for anything except to gain time, said Moore. They're expecting a fresh Mexican force, but we'll see that it comes too late. Then raising his voice, he shouted to his command. Boys, they've chosen to fight. They are there on the hill. A man cannot rush that hill with his horse, but he can rush it with his two legs. The face of the ring-tailed panther became a perfect full moon of delight. Then he paled a little. Do you think there can yet be any new trick to hold us back? He asked Obed anxiously. No, replied Obed cheerfully. Time and tide wait for no Mexicans, and the tides at the flood we charge within a minute. Even as he spoke, Moore shouted, Now, boys, rush him! For the third time, the Texans uttered that deep, rolling cheer. The cannon sent a volley of grape shot into the cluster on the mound, and then the Texans rushed forward at full speed, straight at the enemy. The Mexicans opened a rapid fire with rifles and muskets, and the whole mound was soon clothed in smoke. But the rush of the Texans was so great that in an instant they were at the first slope. They stopped to send in a volley, and they began to rush up the hill, but there was no enemy. The Mexicans gave way in a panic at that very first onset, ran down the slope to their horses, leaped upon them, and galloped away over the prairie. Many threw away their rifles and lances, and, bending low on the necks of their horses, urged them to greater speed. Ned had been in the very front of the rush, Obed on one side and the ring-tailed panther on the other. His heart was beating hard, and there was a fiery mist before his eyes. He heard the bullets whiz past, but once more providence was good to him. None touched him. 
and when the first tremors were over, he was as eager as any of them to reach the crest of the mound and come to grips with the enemy. Suddenly he heard a tremendous roar of disgust. The ring-tailed panther was the author of it. Escaped after all, he cried. They wouldn't stay and fight when they promised they would. At least the Mexicans ride well, said Obed. Ned gazed from the crest of the mound at the flying men, rapidly becoming smaller and smaller as they sped over the prairie. End of chapter 15. Recording by Mr. Duck. Chapter 16 of the Texan Star. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mr. Duck. The Texan Star by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter 16. Many of the Texans were hot for pursuit, but Moore recalled them. His reasons were brief and grim. You will not overtake them, he said, and you will need all your energies later on. This is only the beginning. A number of the Mexicans had been slain, but none of the Texans had fallen, the aim of their opponents being so wild. The triumph had certainly been an easy one, but Ned perhaps rejoiced less than any present. The full mind again projected itself into the future and foresaw great and terrible days. The Texans were but few, scattered thinly over a long frontier, and the range of coasts in Santa Ana would be unbounded when they heard the fight and flight of their troops at Gonzales. Obed, he said to his friend, we are victorious today without loss, but I feel that dark days are coming. The main man looked curiously at the boy. He had already considered Ned, despite his youth, superior in some ways to himself. You've been a reader and a thinker, Ned, he said, and I like to hear what you say. The dark days may come as you predict, because Santa Anne is a great man in the Mexican way. But night can't come until the day is ended, and the day is just now. We won't be gloomy yet. After the fallen Mexicans had been buried, the little force of voluntary soldiers began to disperse, just as they had gathered, of their own accord. The work there was done, and they were riding for their own little villages or lone cabins, where they would find more work to do. The Mexicans would soon fall on Texas like a cloud, and every one of them knew it. Ned, Obed, and the ring-tailed panther rode back to Gonzales, where the women and children welcomed the victors with joyous acclaim. The three sat down with others to a great feast, spread on tables under the shade of oaks, and consisting chiefly of game, buffalo, deer, squirrels, rabbits, and other animals which had helped the early Texans to live. But throughout dinner, Ned and Obed were rather quiet, although the ring-tailed panther roared to his heart's content. It was Ned who spoke first the thought that were in the minds of both Obed and himself. Slowly, by an unconscious process, he was becoming the leader. Obed, he said, Everybody can do as he pleases, and I propose that you and I and the ring-tailed panther scout towards San Antonio. Coase and his army are marching towards that town, and while the Texan campaign of defense is being arranged and the leaders are being chosen, we might give a lot of help. Just what I was thinking, said Obed. Just what I ought to have thought, said the ring-tailed panther. San Antonio was a long journey to the westward, and they started at twilight fully equipped. They carried their usual arms, two blankets apiece, light but warm, food for several days, and double supplies of ammunition, the thing that they would now need most. Gonzalez gave them a farewell full of good wishes. Some of the women exclaimed upon Ned's youth, but Obed explained that the boy had lived through hardships and dangers that would have overcome many a veteran pioneer of Texas. They forded the Guadalupe for the second time on the same day. Then they rode out by the mound which the Mexicans had made the brief stand. The three said little. Even the ring-tailed panther had thoughts that were not voiced. The hill, the site of their first battle and of their great struggle, stood out clear and sharp in the moonlight, but now it was very still. We'll date a good many things from that hill, said Ned as they rode on. They followed the path of the flying Mexicans who, they were quite sure, would make for coasts in San Antonio. The ring-tailed panther knew the most direct course, and as the moon was good, they could also see the trail left by the Mexicans. It was marked further by grim objects, two wounded horses that had died on the flight, and then by a man succumbing, who had been buried in a grave so shallow that no one could help noticing it. A little after midnight, they saw a light ahead, and they judged by the motions that a man was waving a torch. It can't be a trap, said Obed, because the Mexicans would not stop running until they were long past here. And there ain't no cover where that torch is, added the ring-tailed panther. Then suppose we ride forward and see what it means, said Ned. They cocked their rifles, ready for combat if need be, and rode forward slowly. Soon they made out the figure of a man standing on the swell of a prairie, and vigorously waving a torch made of a dead stick lighted at one end. He had a rifle, but it leaned against a bush beside him. 
His belt held a pistol and a knife, but his free hand made no movement toward them as the three rode up. The man himself was young, slender, and of olive complexions, with black hair and eyes. He was a Mexican, but he was dressed in the simple Texan style. Moreover, there were Mexicans born in Texas, some of whom, belonging to the Liberal Party, inclined to the Texan side. This man was distinctly handsome, and the look with which he returned the gaze of the three was frank, free, and open. I saw you from afar, he said in excellent English. I climbed the cottonwood there in order to see that you might be passing on the prairie, and as my eyes happened to be very good, I detected three black dots on the moonlight coming out of the east. As I saw the men of Santa Ana going west as fast as his hoofs could carry them, I knew that only Texans could be riding out of the east. He laughed, threw his torch on the ground, and stamped out the light. I felt that sooner or later someone would come upon Castaneda's track, he said, and you see that I was not wrong. He smiled again. Ned's impression was distinctly favorable, and when he glanced at Obed and the ring-tailed panther, he saw that they too were attracted. Who are you, stranger? asked Palmer. People who meet by night in Texas in these times had best know the names and business of one another. Not a doubt of it, replied the young Mexican. My name is Francisco Urea, and I was born in the Guadalupe. So you see, I am Texan, perhaps more truly a Texan than any of you, because I know by looking at you that all three of you were born in the States. As for my business... He grew very serious and looked at the three one after another. My business, he said, is to fight for Texas. Well spoke by the great horn spoon, roared the ring-tailed panther. Yes, I fight for Texas, resumed young Urea. I was on my way to Gonzales to join you. I was too late for the fight, but I saw the men of Castaneda, with Castaneda himself at their head, flying across the prairie. I assure you that there was no delay on their part. First they were here, and then they were gone. The prairie rumbled with their hasty thread. Their lances glittered for only a single instant, and then they were lost over the horizon. He laughed again, and his laugh was so infectious that the three laughed with him. I know most people in Texas, rumbled the ring-tailed panther. Though there are some Mexican families I don't know. I've heard of the Ureas, and if you want to go with us and join the Terran and Chon, we'll be glad to have you. So we will, said Ned and Obed together, and Obed added, Three are company, four are better. Very well, then, said Urea. I shall be happy to become one of your band, and we will all ride on together. I've no doubt that I can be of help to you if you mean to watch on course. My horse is tied here in a clump of chaparral. Wait a moment, and I will rejoin you. He came back, riding a fine horse, and he was well equipped as the Texans. Then the four rode on towards San Antonio de Bexar. They found that Urea knew much. Cos himself would probably be in San Antonio within a week, and heavy reinforcements would arrive later. The three in return gave him a description of the fight at the mound, and they told how the Texans afterward had scattered for different points on the border. They were not the only riders that night. Men were carrying along the whole frontier the news that the war had begun, that the death struggle was now on between Mexico and Texas, the giant on one side and the pygmy on the other. But the ride of the four and the trail of Castaneda's flying troop was peaceful enough. About three hours after midnight, they stopped under the shelter of some cottonwoods. The ring-tailed panther took the watch while the other three slept. Ned lay awake for a little while between his blankets, but he saw that Urea, who was not ten feet away, had gone sound asleep almost instantly. His olive face, lighted dimly by the moon's rays, was smooth and peaceful, and Ned was quite sure that he would be a good comrade. Then he, too, entered the land of slumber. The ring-tailed panther stalked up and down, his broad, powerful figure becoming gigantic in the moonlight. Belligerent by nature and the born frontiersman, he was very serious now. He knew that they were riding toward a great danger, and he glanced at the face of the sleeping boy. The ring-tailed panther had a heart within him, and the temptation to make Ned go back, if he could, was very strong. But he quickly dismissed it as useless. The boy would not go. Besides, he was skillful, strong, and daring. The ring-tailed panther tramped on. Coyotes howled on the prairie, and the deeper note of a timber wolf came from the right, where there was a thick fringe of trees along a creek. But he paid no attention to them. All the while, he watched the circle of the horizon, narrow by night, for horsemen. If they came, he believed that his warning must be quick, because they were likely to be either Mexicans or Indians. He saw no riders, but toward daylight he saw horses in the west. They were without riders, and he walked to the nearest swell to look at them. He looked down upon a herd of wild horses, many of them clean and fine of build. At their head was a great black stallion, and when the ring-tailed panther saw him, he sighed. At another time, he would have made a try for the stallion's capture, but now there was other business afoot. The wind shifted. The stallion gave a neigh of alarm and galloped off toward the south, the whole herd with streaming manes and tails following close behind. The ring-tailed panther walked back to the cottonwoods and awoke his companions, because it was now full day. 
I saw some wild horses grazing close by, he said, and that means that nobody else is near. Maybe we can ride clean to San Antonio without anybody to stop us. And gain great information for the Texans, said Urea quickly. Houston is to command the forces of eastern Texas, and he would be glad to know just what Coase is doing. And glad will we be to take such news to him, said Ned. I've seen him and talked with him, Don Francisco. He is a great man, and I've ridden too with Jim Bowie and Def Smith and Carnes. Urea smiled pleasantly at Ned's boyish enthusiasm. They are great men too, he said. Bowie, Smith, and Carnes. I should not want any of them one to send his bullet in me. Jim Bowie is best with a knife, said the ring-tailed panther. But I guess no better shots than Def Smith or Hank Carnes were ever born. A horseman is coming, said Ned, who was in advance. The boy had shaded his eyes from the sun, and his uncommonly keen sight had detected the black moving speck before any of the others could see it. It's sure to be a Texan, said Obed. You won't find any Mexican riding alone on these plains just now. They rode forward to meet him, and the horseman, who evidently had keen eyes, too, came forward with equal confidence. It was soon became obvious that he was a Texan, as Obed had predicted. His length of limb and body showed despite the fact that he was on horseback and the long rifle that he carried across the saddle bow was of the frontier type. My name is Jim Potter, he said as he came within hailing distance. You're welcome, Jim Potter, said the ring-tailed panther. The long, red-headed man here on my right is Obed White. The boy is Ned Fulton. Our young Mexican friend, who is a good Texan patriot, is Don Francisco Urrea. And as for me, I'm Martin Palmer, better and more properly known as the ring-tailed panther. I heard of you, panther, said Potter, and you and your friends are just the people I want. He spoke with great eagerness, and the soul of the ring-tailed panther, foreseeing an impending crisis of some kind, responded. What is it? he asked. The crowd is marching on Goliad, replied Potter. The Mexican commander there is treating the people with great cruelty, and he is sending out parties to harass lone Texan homes. We mean to smite him. Potter spoke with a certain solemnity of manner, and he had the lean, aesthetic face of the Puritan. Ned judged that he was from one of the northern states of New England, but Obed, a main man, was sure of it. Friend, said Obed, from which state do you come, New Hampshire or Vermont? I take it that it is Vermont. It is Vermont, as you rightly surmise, replied Potter, and the accent with which you speak, if I mistake not, is found only in Maine. A good guess also, said Obed. But we are now both Texans, heart and soul, is it not so? It is even so, replied Potter gravely. Then he and Obed reached across from their horses and gave each other a powerful clasp. You will go with us to Goliad and help smite the heathen? asked Potter. Obed glanced at his comrades, and all of them nodded. We were riding to San Antonio, said the main man, to find out what was going on there, but I see no reason why we should not turn aside to help you, since we seem to be needed. Our need of you is very great, said Potter in his solemn, unchanging tones. But as we are but few, and the enemy may be wary, yet we must smite him and smite him hard. Then lead the way, said Obed. It is better to be too soon than too late. Without another word, Potter turned his horse toward the south. He was tall and raw-boned, his face burned well by the sun. But he had an angularity, and he bore himself with a certain stiffness that did not belong to the Texans of southern birth. Ned did not doubt that he would be most formidable in combat. After riding at least two hours without anyone speaking a word, Potter said, We will meet the remainder of our friends and comrades about nightfall. We will not exceed fifty, and more probably we shall be scarcely so many as that. But with the strength of just a cause in our arms, it is likely that we shall be enough. When we charged at Gonzales, they stayed for but one look at our faces, said the ring-tailed panther. Then they ran so fast that they were ripping and tearing up the prairie for the next twenty-four hours. I have heard of that, said Potter with a grave smile. The grass is so far from grown, scarcely bent under their feet. Still, the Mexicans at times will fight with the greatest courage. Here, Urea spoke. My friends, he said, I must now leave you. I have an uncle and cousins at the San Antonio River, not far above Goliad. Like myself, they are devoted adherents to the Texan cause, and it is more than likely that they will suffer terribly at the hands of some raiding party from Goliad if they are not warned in time. I have tried to steal my heart and go straight with you to Goliad, but I cannot forget those who are so dear to me. However, it is highly probable that I can give them the warning to flee and yet rejoin you in time for the attack. We hate to lose a good man when there's ripping and tearing ahead of us, said the ring-tailed panther. But if people of his blood are in such great danger, he must even go, said Potter. 
or his face was drawn with lines of mental pain. His expressive eyes showed a great doubt and anguish. Ned felt very sorry for him. It is a most cruel country, said Araya. I would go with you, and yet I would stay. The Texans in her cause have my love, but to us of Mexican blood, the family is also very, very dear. His voice faltered, and Latin tears stood in his eyes. Go, said Obed. You must save your kin, and perhaps, as you hope, you can rejoin us in time. Farewell, said Uriah, but you will see me again soon. He spurred his horse, a powerful animal, and went ahead at a gallop. Soon he disappeared over the swells of the prairie. I hate to see him go, growled the ring-tailed panther. Mexicans are uncertain, even when they are on your side, but he's a big, strong fellow, and he'd be handy in the fight for which we are looking. But he kept Ned's sympathy. He must save his people, said the boy. Obed and Potter said nothing. At twilight, they found the other men waiting for them in a thicket of mesquite, and the total, including the four, was only forty. But with Texan daring and courage, they made straight for Goliad, and Ned did not doubt that they would have a fight. Life was now moving fast for him, and it was crowded with incident. The troop in loose formation rode swiftly, but the hoofs of their horses made little sound on the prairie. The southern moon rode low, and the night was clear. They crossed two or three creeks, and also went through narrow belts of forest, but they never halted or hesitated. Potter and several others knew the way well, and night was the same as day to them. At midnight, Ned saw a wide but shallow stream, much like the Guadalupe. Trees and reeds lined its banks. Potter informed him that this was the San Antonio River, and that they were now below the town of Goliad, where they meant to attack the Mexican force. And if Providence favors us, said Potter, we shall smite them hard and quick. Providence favors those who hit first and hard, said Obed, mixing various quotations. The men forded the river, and, after a brief stop, began to move cautiously through thickets of mesquite and chaparral toward the town, the lights of which they could not yet see. At one point, the mesquite became so thick that Ned, Obed, and the ring-tailed panther dismounted in order to pick their way and led their horses. Ned, who was in advance, heard a noise as of something moving in the thicket. At first he thought it was a deer, but the sound ceased suddenly, as if whatever made them was trying to seek safety and concealment rather than flight. Ned's experience had already made him skillful and daring. The warrior's instinct, born in him, was developing rapidly, and flinging his bridle to Obed, he asked him to hold it for a moment. Before the surprised man could ask why, Ned left him with the reins in his hand, cocked his rifle, and crept through the mesquite toward the point where the sounds had come. He saw a stooping shadow, and then a man sprang up. Quick as a flash, Ned covered him with his rifle. Surrender, he cried. <laughs> Gladly, cried the man, throwing up his hands and laughing in an hysterical way. I yield because you must be a Texan. That cannot be the voice of any Mexican. Obed and the others came forward, and the man strode towards them. He was tall, gaunt, and worn, until he was not much more than a skeleton. His clothing, mere rags, hung loosely on a figure that was now much too narrow for them. Two bloodshot eyes burned in dark caverns. Thank God, he cried. You're Texans, all of you. Watch Ben Milam, said Potter. We thought you were a prisoner at Monterey in Mexico. I was, replied Milam, one of the Texan leaders. But I escaped and obtained a horse. I have ridden nearly 700 miles, day and night. My horse dropped dead down there in the chaparral, and I've been here trying to take a look at Goliad, certain about going in, because I do not know whether it is held by Texans or Mexicans. It is held by Mexicans at present, replied Potter solemnly. But I think that will in an hour or two, and will be held by Texans. If it ain't, there'll be some mighty roaring and ripping and tearing, said the ring-tailed panther. Give me a bite and something to drink, said Milam, and I'll help you turn Goliad from a Mexican into a Texan town. Exhausted and nearly starved, he showed, nevertheless, the dauntless spirit of the Texans. Food and drink were given to him, and the little party moved toward the town. Presently they saw one or two lights. Far off a dog howled, but it was only at the moon. He had not scented them. By and by, the ground grew so rough and the bushes so thick that all dismounted and tethered their horses. Then they crept into the very edge of the town, still unseen and unheard. Potter pointed to a large building. That, he said, is the headquarters of Colonel Sandoval, the commandant. And if you look closely, you'll see a sentinel walking up and down before the door. We'll make a rush for that house, said the leader of the Texans, and call upon the sentinel to yield. They slipped from the cover and ran toward the house, shouting to the Mexican on guard to surrender but he fired at them point-blank, although his bullet missed, and a shot from one of the Texans slew him. The next moment they were thundering at the door of the house, in which Sandoval and the larger part of his garrison. 
The door held fast and shots were fired at them from the windows. Some of the Texans ran to the neighboring houses, obtained axes, and smashed in the door. Then they poured in, every man striving to be first, and most of the Mexicans fled through the back doors or the windows, escaping in the darkness into the Mexquite and Chaparral. Sandoval himself, half-dressed, was taken by the ring-tailed panther and Obed. He made many threats, but Obed replied, You have chosen war, and the Texans are giving it to you as best they can. Our bullets fall on all Mexicans, whether just or unjust. Sandoval said no more, but finished his interrupted toilet. It was clear to Ned, watching his face, that the Mexican colonel considered all the Texans doomed, despite their success at the moment. Sandoval was still in his quarters. His arms had been taken away, but he suffered no ill treatment. Despite the rapid flight of the Mexican soldiers, twenty-five or thirty had been taken, and they were held outside. The Texans, not knowing what to do with them, decided to release them later on parole. Ned was about to leave Sandoval's room when he met at the door a young man, perspiring, wild of eye, and bearing all other signs of haste and excitement. It was Francisco Urea. I am too late, he cried. Alas, alas, I would have it have a share in this glorious combat. I should like to have taken Sandoval with my own hand. I have cause to hate that man. Sandoval was sitting on the edge of his bed, and the eyes of the two Mexicans flashed anger at each other. Urea went up and shook his hand in the face of Sandoval. Sandoval shook his in the face of Herrera. Wrath was equal between them. Fierce words were exchanged with such swiftness that Ned could not understand them. He judged that the young Mexican must have some deep cause of hatred of Sandoval. But the ring-tailed panther interfered. He did not like this trait of abusing a fallen foe, which he considered typically Mexican. Come away, Don Francisco, he said. The ripping and tearing are over, and we can do our roaring outside. He took Herrera by the arm and led him away. Ned preceded them. Outside, he met Obed, who was in the highest spirits. We've done more than capture Mexicans, he said. It never rains, but turns into a storm. We've gone through the Mexican barracks, and we've made a big haul here. Let's take a look. Ned went with him, and when he saw, he too exulted. Goliath had been made a place of supply by the Mexicans, and stored there, the Texans had taken a vast quantity of ammunition, rounds of powder, and lead to the scores of thousands, 500 rifles and three fine cannon. Some of the Texans joined hands in a wild Indian dance when they saw their spoils, and the eyes of Ned and Obed listened. Unto the righteous shall be given, said Obed. We've done far better tonight than we hoped. We'll need these in the advance on Cos and San Antonio. They will be of the greatest service, said Urea, who joined them at the moment. How I envy you your glory. What happened to you, Don Francisco? asked Obed. I carried the warning to my uncle and his family, replied Urea. I was just in time. Guerrillas, of course, came an hour later and burned the house to the ground. They destroyed everything, the tables and barns, and they even killed the horses and the cattle. Ah, what a ruin. I rode back by there on my way to Goliad. The young Mexican pressed his irons over his eyes, and Ned thrilled with sympathy. What became of your uncle and his family? asked the boy. They rode north for San Felipe de Austin. They will be safe, but they lose all. Never mind, said Obed. We'll make the Mexicans pay it back when we drive him out of Texas. I don't believe that any good patriot will suffer. Nevertheless, said Urea, my uncle is willing to lose and endure for the cause. Ned slept half through the morning in one of the little adobe houses, and at noon he, Obed, the ring-tailed panther, and others rode toward San Antonio. They slept that night in a pecan grove, and on the next day continued their journey, meeting in the morning. A Texan who informed them that Coast was with a formidable force was in San Antonio. He also confirmed the information that the Texans were gathering from all points for the attack upon this, the greatest of Mexican fortress in all Texas. Mr. Austin was commander-in-chief of the forces, but he wished to yield the place to Houston, who would not take it. Late in the afternoon, they saw horsemen and rode toward them boldly. The group was sixty or eighty in number, and they stopped for the smaller body to approach. Ned's keen eyes recognized them first, and he uttered a cry of joy. There's Mr. Bowie, he said, and there are Smith and Carnes, too. They are all on their way to San Antonio. He took off his hat and waved it joyously. Smith and Carnes did the same, and Bowie smiled gravely as the boy rode up. Well, Ned, he said, we meet again, and I judge that we ride on the same errand. We do, to San Antonio. And there will be the biggest fight that was ever seen in Texas, said the ring-tailed panther, who knew Bowie well. If Mexicans and Texans want to get to roaring and ripping, they'll have a chance. They will, panther said Bowie, still smiling gravely. Then he looked inquiringly at Urea. This is Don Francisco Urea, said Obed. He was born in Texas, and he is with us heart and soul. 
By a hard ride, he saved his uncle and family from slaughter by the guerrillas, of course, and he reached Goliad just a few minutes too late to take part in the capture of the Mexican force. Some of the Mexicans born in Texans are with us, said Bowie, and before we are through with San Antonio, Don Francisco, you will have a good chance to prove your loyalty to Texas. I shall prove it, said Araya vehemently. The place for the gathering of our troops is on Salado Creek near San Antonio, said Bowie, and I think that we shall find both Mr. Austin and General Houston there. Bowie was extremely anxious to be at a conference with the leaders, and taking Ned, Obed, the ring-tailed panther, and a few others, he rode ahead. Ned suggested that Urea go too, but Bowie did not seem anxious about him, and he was left behind. Maybe he would be extremely eager to fire upon people of his own blood if we should happen to meet the Mexican lancers, said Bowie. I don't like to put a man to such a test before I have to do it. Urea showed disappointment, but after some remonstrance, he submitted with fair grace. I'll see you again before San Antonio, he said to Ned. Ned shook his hand and galloped away with the little troop, which all numbered only sixteen. Bowie kept them at a rapid pace until sundown, and far after. Ned saw that the man was full of care, and he too appreciated the importance of the situation. Events were coming to a crisis, and very soon the Texans and the Army of Coast would stand face to face. They slept on the open prairie, and were in the saddle again before dawn. Bowie now curved a little to the north, they were coming into country over which Mexicans rode, but he did not wish a clash. But the ring-tailed panther was not sanguine about a free passage, nor did he seem to care. It's likely that the Mexican bands are out riding, he said. Coast ain't no fool, and he'll be on the lookout for us. There's more timber as you come towards San Antonio, and there will be a lot of chances for ambushes. I believe you are hoping for one, said Ned. The ring-tailed panther did not answer, but he looked upon this young friend of his, of whom he thought so much, and his dark face parted in one of the broadest smiles that Ned had ever seen. I ain't running away from the chance of it, he replied. They saw a little later a belt of timber to their right. Ned's experience told him that it masked the bed of a creek, probably flowing toward the San Antonio River, and he noticed, although they were at some distance, that the trees seemed to be of unusually fine growth. This fact first attracted his attention, but he lost sight of it when he saw a glint of unusually bright light among the trunks. He looked more closely. Here again, experience was of value. It was the peculiar kind of light that he had seen before, when a ray from the sun struck squarely on the steel head of a lance. Look, he said to Obed and Bowie. They looked, and Bowie instantly halted his men. The face of the ring-tailed panther suddenly lighted up. He had two good eyes, and he said in tones of satisfaction, Figures are moving among the trees, and there are those of mounted men with lances. Texans don't carry lances, and I think we shall be attacked by a Mexican force within a few minutes, Colonel Bowie. It is altogether probable, replied Bowie. See, they are coming from the wood, and they number at least sixty. Near seventy, I think, said Obed. Whether sixty or seventy, they are not too many for us to handle, said Bowie. The Mexicans had seen the little group of Texans, and they were coming fast. The wind had brought their shouts, and they brandished their long lances. Ned observed with admiration how cool Bowie and all the men remained. Line up in a line, said Bowie. Here, Ned, bring your horse by me, and all you face the Mexicans. Loosen your pistols, and when I give the word to fire, let them have it with your rifles. They were on the crest of one of the swells, and the sixteen horses stood in a row so straight that a line stretched across their front and would have touched the head of every one. They were trained horses, too, and the riders dropped the reins on their necks while they held their rifles ready. It was hard for Ned to keep his nerves steady, but Obed was on one side of him and Bowie on the other, while the ring-tailed panther was just beyond Obed. Pride as well as necessity kept him motionless and taut like the others. Doubtless the Mexicans would have turned, had it not been for the smallness of the force opposing to them. But they came on rapidly and in a long line, still shouting and brandishing their weapons. Ned saw the flaming eyes of the horses, and he marked the foam upon their jaws. For what was Bowie waiting? Nearer they came, and the beat of the hoofs thundered in their ears. It seemed that the flashing steel of the lances was at his throat. He had already raised his rifle, and was taking careful aim at the man in front of him, all his nerves now taut for the conflict. Fire! cried Bowie, and sixteen rifles were discharged as one. Not a bullet went astray. The Mexican line was split asunder. The horses and men went down in a mass. A few horses and men rose and ran across the plain, but the wings of the Mexican force closed in and continued the charge, expecting victory now that the rifles were empty. But they forgot the pistols. Ned snatched his from the holster and fired directly into the evil face of a lancer who was about to crash into him. 
The Mexican fell to the ground, and his horse, swerving to one side, galloped on. The pistols cracked all around Ned, and then the Mexicans, shearing off, fled as rapidly as they had charged, but they left behind several who would never charge again. All right, Ned, said the cheery voice of Obed. Not hurt at all, replied the boy, but as he spoke, he gazed down at the face of the man who had tried to crash into him, and he shuddered. He knew that face. At the first glance, it had seemed familiar, and at the second, he had remembered perfectly. It was the face of the man who had struck him with the butt of a lance on that march in Mexico when he was the prisoner of Coast. It seemed a vengeance dealt out by the hand of fate. He who had received the blow had given it in return, although not knowing at the time. Ned recognized the justice of fate, but he did not rejoice, nor did he speak of the conscience to anyone. It was not a thing of which he wished to talk. They're gone, said the ring-tailed panther, speaking now in satisfied tones. They came, they stayed half a minute, and then they went. But there was some ripping and tearing and chawing. Yes, they've gone, and they've gone to stay, said Bowie. It was a foolish thing to do to charge Texans armed with rifles on the open prairie. Ned was looking at the last Mexican as he disappeared over the plain. End of chapter 16. Recording by Mr. Duck. Chapter 17 of the Texan Star. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mr. Duck. The Texan Star by Joseph A. Outscheller. Chapter 17. The Texans gathered up the arms of the fallen Mexicans, except the lances for which they had no use, finding several good rifles and a number of pistols of improved make which were likely to prove of great value, and then they rode on as briskly as if nothing has happened. The next day they drew near to San Antonio and entered the beautiful valley made by the San Antonio River and the creek to which the Mexicans gave the name San Pedro. Ned found it all very luxuriant and very refreshing to eyes tired of the prairies and the plains. Despite the fact that it was the middle of October, the green yet endured on that southern latitude. Splendid forests still in foliage bounded both creek and river. They rode through noble groves of oak and tall pecans. They saw many fine springs sprouting from the earth and emptying into river and creek. It was a noble land, but, although it had been settled long by Spaniard and Mexican, the wilderness still endured in many of its aspects. Now and then a deer sprang up from the thickets, and the wild turkeys still roosted in the trees. Churches and other buildings, many of massive stone, adorned with carved and costly marbles, extended ten or twelve miles down the river, but most of them were abandoned and in decay. The Comanche and his savage brother, the Apache, had raided to the very gates of San Antonio. The deep irrigation ditches dug by the Spanish priests and other Indian converts were abandoned, and mud and refuse were fast filling them up. Already an old civilization, sunk in decay, was ready to give place to another, rude and raw, but full of youth and vigor. It was likely that Ned alone felt these truths, as they reached the lowest outskirts of the missions and stopped at an abandoned stone convent, built at the very edge of the San Antonio, where the waters of the river, green and clear, flowed between banks clothed in a deep and luxuriant foliage. Half of the troop entered the convent, while the others watched on the horses outside. It impressed Ned with a sense of desolation, fully equal to that of the ancient pyramid or the lost city. Everything of value that the nuns had not taken away had been stripped from the place by Comanche, Apache, or Lipan. It was nearly night when they arrived at the convent. The Texan camp still lay some miles away. Their horses were very tired, and Bowie decided to remain in the ruined building until morning. The main portion of the structure was of stone, two stories high, but there were some extensions of wood from of which the floor had been taken away by plunderers. It was Ned who discovered this floorless room, and he suggested that they lead the horses into it, especially as the night was turning quite cold and there were signs of rain. A good thought, said Bowie. We'll do it. The horses made some trouble at the door, but when they were finally driven in and unsaddled and unbridled, they seemed content. Two windows, from which the glass was long since gone, admitted an abundance of air, and Ned and several others, taking their big Bowie knives, went out and cut grass for them. On foot, Ned was impressed more than ever by the desolation and loneliness of the place. The grounds had been surrounded by an adobe wall, now broken through in many places. On one side had been a little flower garden, and on the other a larger kitchen garden. One or two late roses bloomed in the flower garden, but most of it had been destroyed by weather. 
Ned and the others cut armfuls of grass in a little meadow just beyond the adobe wall, and they hastened the work. They did not like the looks of the night. The skies were darkening very fast, and they saw occasional flashes of lightning in the far southwest. Ned looked back at the convent. It was now an almost formless bulk against the somber sky, its most prominent feature being the cupola, on which a bronze bell still hung. The wind rose, and the cold drops of rain struck him. He shivered. It promised to be one of those raw, cold nights frequent in the southwest, and he knew that the rain would be chill and penetrating. He was glad that they had found the convent. They gave the grass to the horses, and then they went into the main portion of the convent, where Bowie and the rest were already at work. Here the ruin was not so great, as the Spaniards had built in a solid manner according to their custom. They found a large room with an open fireplace, in which Ned would have been glad to see wood blazing, but Bowie did not consider it worthwhile to gather materials for a fire. Adjoining this room was a chapel, in which a pulpit, a desecrated image of the Virgin, and some frames without the pictures yet remained. Anger filled Ned's heart that anyone should plunder and spoil such a place, and he turned sorrowfully away. Back of the large rooms were workrooms, kitchen, and laundry, all stripped of nearly everything. The narrow stairway that led to the upper floor was in good condition, and, when Ned mounted it, he saw rows of narrow, little cell-like rooms in which the nuns had slept. All were bleak and bare, but from a broken window at the end of the corridor, he looked out upon the San Antonio and the forests of Oak and Pecan. He could barely see the river, the night had grown so dark. The cold rain increased and was lashed against the building by a moaning wind. Once more Ned shivered, and once more he was glad that they had found the old convent. He was glad to return to the main room, where Bowie and the others were gathered. The room had been lighted by two windows, facing the San Antonio, and two on the side. They had been closed originally by shutters, which were now gone, but as the windows were narrow and the driving rain did not enter far, one or two of the men, sharing Ned's earlier feeling, spoke up in favor of a fire. They wanted the cheerfulness that light and warmth give, but Bowie refused again. Not necessary, he said. We are here in the enemy's country, and we do not want to give him warning of our presence. We met the Lancers today, and we have no desire to meet them again tonight. Right. The ring-tailed panther roared gently to Ned. When you're making war, you must fight first and take your pleasure afterward. It was warm enough in the room, and the open windows still gave them all the air they needed. Every man, except those detailed for the guard, spread his blankets and went to sleep. Ned was on the early watch. He, too, would have liked sleep. He would have felt wonderfully fine rolled in the blankets, with the cold rain pattering on the walls outside. But he was chosen for the first watch, and his time would come later. Ned was posted at a broken door that led to the extension in which the horses were sheltered. The remaining sentinels, three in number, including the ring-tailed panther, were stationed in different parts of the building. The boy, from his position in the broken doorway, could see into the room where his comrades slept, and, when he looked in the other direction, he could also see the horses, some of which were now lying down. It was all very still in the old convent. So deep was the silence that Ned began to fancy that he heard the breathing of his sleeping comrades. It was only fancy. The horses had ceased to stir. Perhaps they were as glad as the men that they had found shelter. But outside, Ned heard distinctly the moaning of the wind and the lashing of the cold rain against the roof and walls. On the right, where the extension had been connected with the main building of stone, there was a great opening, and through this Ned looked down toward the adobe wall in San Antonio. He saw dimly across the river a dark, waving mass, which he knew to be the pecan trees, bending in the wind but on his own side of the stream he could distinguish nothing. But he watched there unceasingly, save for the occasional glances at the horses or his sleeping comrades. He could now see objects very well within the room. He was able to count his comrades sleeping on the floor. He saw two empty picture frames on the wall, and nearby a rope, which he surmised led to the bell in the cupola, and which some chance had allowed to remain there. Now and then, Ned and one of his comrades of the watch met and exchanged a few words but they always spoke in whispers, lest they awaken the sleeping men. After these brief meetings, Ned would return to his watch at the opening. The character of the night did not change as time trailed its slow length away. One solid black cloud covered the sky from horizon to horizon. The wind out of the southwest never ceased to moan, and the cold rain blew steadily upon the walls and roof of the ruined convent. It was not a night when either Texans or Mexicans would wish to be abroad, and, as the chill grew sharper and more penetrating, Ned wrapped one of his blankets about his shoulders. As the night advanced, Ned's sense of oppression deepened. 
He felt once more as he had felt at the pyramid, that he was among old dead things. Ghosts could walk here as truly as they could walk on the banks of the Teotihuacan. Sometimes, as the great cloud lightened the least bit, he caught glimpses of the grass and weeds that grew between him and the broken adobe wall, which was about fifteen yards away. Only an hour more, and the second watch would come on. Ned began to think of his place on the floor, and of the deep and dreamless sleep that he knew would be his. Then he was attracted by a glimpse of the adobe wall. It seemed to him that he had seen a projection where there was none before. He looked a second time, and he did not see it. Fancy played strange tricks at midnight in the enemy's country, and in the desolate silence. Ned shook himself. Although a vivid imagination might be excusable at such time even in a man, a veteran of many campaigns, he was essentially an uncompromising realist, and he wished to see facts exactly as they were. The work upon which he was engaged allowed no time for the breeding of fancy. He looked again, and there were two projections where he had seen only one before. They resembled knobs on the adobe wall, rising perhaps half a foot above it, and the sight troubled Ned. Was fancy to prove too strong when he had drilled himself so long to see the real? Was he to be played by the imagination, as if he had no will of his own? He thought once of his speaking to the sentinels at the other doors, but he could not compel himself to do it. They would laugh at him, and it is a bitter thing to be laughed at. So he kept his watch, and while he looked, the projections appeared, disappeared, and appeared once more. He could stand it no longer. Putting his rifle under his blanket, in order to keep the weapon dry, he stepped out of doors, but flattened himself against the wall of the convent. The rain and the wind whipped him unmercifully, and the cold ran through him, but he was resolved to see what was happening by the adobe wall. The projections were there, and they had increased to four. They did not go away. Ned was now convinced that it was not fancy. His mind had obeyed his will, and he was the true realist, no victim of the imagination. He was about to kneel down in the grass and crawl toward the wall when something caused him to change his mind. One of the projections suddenly extended a full yard above the wall and resolved itself into the shape of a man. But what a man! The body from the waist up was naked, and above it rose a head crested with long hair, black and coarse. Other heads and bodies, also savage and naked, rose up beside it on the wall. Ned knew in an instant, and springing back within the convent, he cried, Comanches! Comanches! Up, men, up! At the same moment, acting on impulse, he seized the rope that hung by the wall and pulled it hard, fast, and often. Above the cupola, the great bronze bell boomed forth a tremendous, solemn note that rose far over the moaning of the wind. From the adobe wall came a fierce yell, a sinister cry that swelled until it became a high and piercing volume of sound, and then died away in a menacing note like the howl of wolves. But Ned, impulse still his master, never ceased to pull the bell. All the Texans were on their feet at once, wide awake, rifles in their hands. Lie down, men, by the doors, cried Bowie, and shoot anything that tries to come in. Ned, let go the rope. You are in range there and lie down with us. But you have done well, boy, you have done well. You may have saved us all from being scalped, and perhaps the booming of the big bell will bring us help that we may need badly. Ned threw himself on the floor just in time to avoid a bullet that sang in the open doorway. But no other shot was fired then. The Comanches, in silence, sang back into the darkness and the rain. The defenders lay on the floor, guarding the doorways with open rifles. They could not see much, but they could hear well, and since Ned had given the warning in time, every one of the little party felt that they held a fortress. Ned's pulses were still leaping, but great pride was in his heart. It was he, not one of the veterans, who had saved them, and Bowie had instantly spoken words of high approval. He was now lying flat on the floor, but he looked out once more at the same opening. There were certainly no projections on the wall now, but he could not tell whether the Comanches were inside it or outside. If they crept to the sides of the convent's stone walls, the riflemen could not reach them there. He wondered how many they were, and how they had happened to raid so near San Antonio at this time. Then ensued a long and trying period of silence. Less experienced men than the Texans might have thought that the Comanches had gone away after the failure of their attempt at surprise, but these veterans knew better. Bowie and all of them men were trying to divine their point of attack and how to meet it. For the present, they could do nothing but watch the doorways and guard themselves against a sudden rush of their dangerous foe. Panther, said Obed White, it seems to me that you're getting all the ripping and tearing and chawing that you want on this trip. It ain't what you might call monotonous, said the ring-tailed panther. I'll agree to that much. It had been fully an hour now since Ned had rung the great bell, and they heard no noises save the usual ones of the night, the wind and the rain. 
He surmised at last that the Comanches had taken advantage of the war between the Texans and Mexicans to make a raid in the San Antonio Valley, expecting to gallop in, do their terrible work, and then be away. Doubtless it had not occurred to them that they would meet such a group that was led by Bowie and the ring-tailed panther. Ned, said Bowie, creep across the floor there to that rope and ring the bell again. Ring it a long time. Either it will hurry the Comanches into action, or friends of ours will hear it. It's likely that all the Mexicans now, withdrawn into the San Antonio Valley, and that only Texans, besides this band of Comanches, are abroad in the valley. Ned wormed himself across the floor, and then, pressing himself against the wall, reached up for the rope. A strange thought darted into his brain. He had a deep feeling for music, and he could play both the violin and piano. He could also ring chimes. He was keyed to the utmost, every pulse and vein surcharged with the emotion that comes from a desperate situation and the great impulse to save it. The great bell suddenly began to peel forth the air of the star-spangled banner. Some of the notes may have gone wrong, there may have been errors of time and emphasis, but the old tune, then young, was there. Every man lying on the floor, every one of whom was born in the States, knew it, and every heart leaped. Elsewhere, it might have been a commonplace thing to do, but there in the night and the storm, surrounded by enemies, on a vast and lonely frontier, it was an inspiration. Every Texan in the valley who heard it would know that it was the call of a friend asking for help, and he would come. Not a Texan moved, but they breathed heavily. Overhead, the great bell boomed solemnly on, and Ned, his hand on the rope, put all his heart and strength into the task. A rifle cracked and a bullet entered the doorway, but it passed over the heads of the Texans and flattened against a stone wall beyond. A rifle inside cracked in response, and a Comanche in the grass and weeds uttered a death yell. I was watching for just a chance, said the ring-tailed panther in satisfied tones. I saw him when he rose to fire. Just as you thought, Mr. Bowie, the bell is making their nerves raw, and they feel that they must do something right away. What a queer note that was in Ned's tune, suddenly exclaimed Obed. Bowie laughed. An angry Comanche shot at the bell and hit it. That's what happened, he said. They can waste as many bullets as they please in that way. But the Comanches wasted no more just then. A noise came from the horses. The shots evidently had alarmed them, and they were beginning to stamp and rear. Four men, at the order of Bowie, slipped into the improvised stable and sought to quiet them. They also remained there to keep a guard at the broken windows. Ned, unconscious now how much time had passed, was still ringing the bell. You can rest now, Ned, said Bowie. That was a good idea of yours, and you can repeat it later on. I'm thinking that the Comanches will soon act, if they are going to act at all. But nothing occurred for nearly an hour, when the horses began to rear and stamp again. Two or three of them also uttered shrill neighs. Bowie, with Ned, Obed, and the ring-tailed panther, joined the four already in the improvised stable. The horses would not be quieted. It was quite evident that instinct was warning them of something that human beings could not detect. Ned wondered. He put his hand on the neck of his own horse, which knew him well, yet the beast trembled all over, uttered a shrill neigh. It was quite dark in the place, only a little light coming in through the broken windows, yet Ned was quite sure that no Comanches had managed to get inside and lie in hiding there. A few moments later, the ring-tailed panther uttered a fierce cry. I smell smoke, he cried. That's why the horses are so scared. The demons have managed to set fire to this place, which is wood. That's why they've been so quiet. Ned, too, now smelt the strong odor of smoke, and a spurt of fire appeared at a crack between two of the planks at the far end of the place. The struggles of the horses increased. They were wild with fright. Ned instantly recognized the danger. The burning wooden building would fill the stone convent itself with flame and smoke and make it untenable. The sparks already had become many, and the odor of smoke was increasing. Their situation suddenly became desperate, and growing more so every instant. But they were the Texans, inured to every kind of danger. Bowie shouted for more men to come from the convent, leaving only five or six on guard there. Then the Texans began to bring method and procedure out of the turmoil. Some held the horses, others, led by Bowie, kicked loose the light planks where the fire had been started, and hurled them outward. They were nearly choked by the smoke, but they worked on. The Comanches, many of whom were hugging the wall, shouted their war cry and began to fire into the opening that Bowie and his men had made. They could not take much aim because of the smoke, but their bullets wounded two Texans. Despite the danger, Bowie and most of his men were still compelled to work at the fire. The room was full of smoke, and behind them the horses were yet struggling with those who held them. The ring-tailed panther lay down and, resting himself on one elbow, took aim with his rifle. He was almost clear of the smoke which hung in a bank above him. Ned noticed him and imitated him. 
He saw a dusky figure outside, and when he fired, it fell. The ring-tailed panther did as well, and Obed joined them. While Bowie and the others were dashing out the fire, three great marksmen were driving back the Comanches who sought to take advantage of the diversion. Good, good, cried Bowie as they knocked out the last burning plank. That ends the fire, said Obed. And now we've got a hole here which is not so deep as well, nor so wide as a barn door. But I do not think it will suffice for our friends the Comanches. All the men turned their attention to the enemy, and, lying on the ground, they took as good aim as the darkness would permit. The Texan rifles cracked fast, and, despite the darkness, the bullets often found the chosen targets. The Comanches had been shouting the war whoop continuously, but now their cries began to die, and their fire with it. Never a very good marksman, the Indian was no match for the Texans, every one of whom was a sharpshooter, armed with a fine rifle of long range. The Texans also fired from the shelter of the building, and, as the great cloud was now parting, letting through shafts from the moon, the Comanches were unable to find a good hiding in the weeds and grass. The bullets pursued them there. No matter how low they lay, the keen eye of some Texan searched them out, and sent in the fatal or wounding bullet. Soon they were driven to the shelter of the adobe wall, where they lay, and for a little while returned a scattering fire which did no harm. After it ceased, no Comanche uttered a war whoop, and there was silence again, save for the rain, which now trickled down softly. Bowie distributed sentinels at the openings, including the new one made by the fire, and then the Texans took count of themselves. They had not escaped unscathed. One lying on the floor had received a bullet in his head and then died in silence, unnoticed in the battle. Two men had suffered wounds, but they were not severe, and would not keep them from taking part in the renewal of the combat, should it come. All this reckoning was made in the dusk of the old convent, and with the weariness of both body and soul that comes after a period of great and prolonged exertion. Within the two rooms that they had defended, the odor of burned gunpowder was strong, stinging throat and nostrils. Eddies of smoke hung between floor and ceiling, many of the men coughed, and it was long before they could reduce the horses to entire quiet. They wrapped the dead man in his blankets and laid him in a corner. They bound up the hurts of the others as best they could, and then, save for the watching, they relaxed completely. Ned, his back against the wall, sat with his friends Obed and the ring-tailed panther. He was utterly exhausted, and even in the dusk the men noticed it. Here, Ned, said Obed, take a chew of this. You may not feel that you need it, but it will be a good thing for you. He extended a strip of dried venison. Ned thanked him and ate, although he had not felt hungry. By and by he grew stronger, and then Bowie called to him. Ned, he said. Crawl across the floor again. Be sure you do not raise your head until you reach the wall. Then ring the bell until I tell you to stop. I have a notion that somebody will come by morning. Boys, the rest of you be ready with your rifles. It was the bell before that brought on the attack. Ned slid across the floor and once more pulled the rope with the old fervor, sending the notes of the tune that he could play best far out in the valley of San Antonio. But no reply came from the Comanches. They did not dare to rush the place again in the face of those deadly Texan rifles. They made no sound while the bell played on, but the Texans knew that they still lay behind the adobe wall, ready for a shot at an incautious head. Ned rang for a full half hour before Bowie told him to quit. Then he crept back to his place. He put his head on his folded blanket and, although not intending it, fell asleep, despite the close air of the place. But he awoke before it was dawn and hastily sat up, ashamed. When he saw in the dark that half the men were asleep, he was ashamed no longer. Bowie, who was standing by one of the doors, but sheltered from a shot, smiled at him. The sun will rise in a half hour, Ned, he said, and you've waked up in time to hear the answer to your ringing of the bell. Listen. Ned strained his ears. He heard a faint, far sound, musical like his own call. It seemed to him to be the note of a trumpet. Horsemen are coming, said Bowie, and unless I am far wrong, they are Texans. Ring again, Ned. The bell boomed forth once more, and for the last time. Clear and sharp came the peal of the trumpet in answer. One by one, the men awoke. The light was now appearing in the east, the gray trembling into silver. From the valley came the rapid beat of hoofs, a rifle shot, and then three or four more. Bowie ran out of the door, and Ned followed him. Across the meadows, the Comanches scurried on their ponies, and a group of white men sent a volley after them. Then the white men galloped toward the convent. Bowie walked forward to meet them. You are never more welcome, Fannin, he said to the leader of the group. The man sprang from his horse and grasped Bowie's hand. We rode as fast as we could, but I didn't know it was you, Jim, he said. Some of our scouts heard a bell somewhere playing the Star-Spangled Banner for the night. We thought they were dreaming, but they swore to it. So we concluded that it must be a call for help, and I came with the troop that you see here. 
We lost the direction once or twice, but the bell called us back. For that, said Bowie, you have to thank this boy here. A boy in years only, but a man in action, and two men in mind and courage. This is Ned Fulton, Colonel Fannin. Ned blushed and expostulated, but Bowie took nothing back. Fannin looked about him curiously. You seem to have had something of a fight here, he said. Down in the grass and weeds, we saw several Comanches who will trouble no more. We had all we wanted, said Bowie. We should be glad to ride at once with you to camp. I bring some good men for the cause, and there are more behind. They buried the fallen man in the old flower garden, and then rode swiftly for the Texan camp on the Salado. End of chapter 17. Recording by Mr. Duck.